During World War II, a lot of countries put big guns on aircraft. Whether it was a PBJ-1, a B-18, a ME-410 or this German Junkers 88 featuring a Pac-40 7.5cm anti-tank gun. But was it actually effective? Well, glad you asked. I am Chris. I go to military archives like the one in Germany and I have a full experience report. Well, actually multiple reports from the Luftwaffe to tell you exactly what they thought of this idea. Spoiler alert, there's gonna be a lot of damage in this episode. This video is also sponsored by our partner Frostmaster for flight sim controllers, except no substitutes. And make sure to also check out the description for a discount code on uh, quite a few of their fantastic control peripherals. For this one, let's focus on the Germans. They put a 7.5 centimeter anti-tank gun on the JU-88 to test if it was viable as an anti-tank aircraft or Panzerjäger, tank hunter, as they were sometimes called by the Luftwaffe. They did the same with the Henschel 129 and a lot of other guns from 3 cm to 5 cm on a lot of other aircraft, as you all know. The reasoning behind this was notably different to other countries like the US, who put a 75 into a B-25, well, the PBJ, because it's the Navy variant, or Sweden, who put a 57 in the B-18. Those were mainly, not uniquely, but mainly used for anti-shipping, whereas the Germans really, on the Eastern Front, they mainly wanted the tanks to be gone. Incidentally, if you want to know more about the B-25 and the PBJ, you can't go wrong with this book by William Wolfe. Uh, a Patreon supporter Mitchell sent this to me some time ago and I've gotten some great use out of it and I cannot recommend it enough. Back to the JU-88. Today's primary source, oh, I love really saying primary source, it's actually sources, uh, comes from the Versuchskommando für Panzerbekämpfung dated in April 1943. So there's a little bit of puzzling involved in all of this because initially in April 1943 they had five JU-88Ps with the 75 or 7.5 centimeters as they call it and eight further ones were ready without crews. So of those five JU-88Ps I assumed that I would find some sort of experience reports. However, the next file that I have, at least dated wise, comes in May 1943 and that indicates that no missions had been flown yet. And based on the files that I have, when I broadened my search a bit, it appears that they were only really pushed to the actual front line to take part in the fighting in September 1943. And the reason for this delay may be glimpsed from telegram I found from the 25th of January 1943, where it says that regarding the JU-88 with the Pac-40, JU-88s are not operational, reasons, no armor protection for crew and ammunition, carrying capacity increase from 9 to 20 rounds remains unclear, 200 rounds needed as soon as possible, firing against tanks is carried out with provisionally prepared ammunition. According to Rheinmetall, Junkers will have two modified reinforced JU-88s available at the beginning of February. Short-term assignment for the purposes of verifying armament with live ammunition is necessary because these are the first versions. So based on the information that I have, there seems to be, have been quite a long delay between these aircraft being made available and tested and then being pushed to the front lines, at least from January to September 1943. And of course, we shouldn't also forget that in fall 1942, that's when really this anti-tank business started for the Luftwaffe. So there's at least one year that has passed here until these aircraft started to appear on the front line. At least from the information that I have with the files that I found, we have that big hole until the 1st to the 7th of September 1943, when six JU-88s then with 7.5 centimeter cannons were ordered to be based around Bryansk on the Eastern Front. Only a few days later, they were then cleared for a trial operation on the front line. 13th of September 1943, Experimental Anti-Tank Command with JU-88P1, 7.5 centimeter BK, was made available for the purposes of gaining experience in fighting tanks from the air with large caliber weapons, with the express instructions to be used only against tanks that have broken through friendly lines. So around the time of this telegram, there seems to have already been a couple of missions that were flown on the 10th, 11th and the 13th of September. And once again, we can see from those experience reports that in real life, missions appear a lot more mundane than we are sometimes told. First mission on the 10th of September, 
two JU-88P1s on tanks that broke through friendly lines, one JU-88 turned back because of engine failure, the other JU-88 had to turn back after recognizing the targets and its first attack because of strong fighter defense, seven fighters, since friendly fighter protection had to fly home because of a lack of fuel. Then we have the second mission, two JU-88P1s on tanks that broke through friendly lines, one JU-88 effectively strafed a tank, one JU-88 destroyed a truck due to a lack of tank targets. JU-88 received eight hits, infantry rounds in fuselage, propeller, and a hydraulic line. Then the third mission, on the 11th of September, two JU-88P1s in the same area as the second mission. Due to a lack of tank targets, the mission had to be aborted despite an exhaustive reconnaissance of 35 minutes. And then the final mission I have a file on happened on the 13th of September, two JU-88P1s on tanks, eight kilometers behind the advancing Russian spearhead. One JU-88 received hits near the left aileron. Both spars shot through during the first attack. The damaged aircraft returned. The second JU-88 broke off after its second attack because of jamming. Now in the file I have, there isn't more about the operational use of the JU-88P, but there is a lot of information that may help us understand why these missions were probably not carried out in a high number. I mean, even in the literature, these planes are basically only mentioned, they're completely glossed over, and then the historians quickly jump back to the JU-87s and the Henshaw 129s because there's just so much more information on those against tanks. Anyway, I have this really cool file I want to share with you that shows what happens when you in fact put a Pac-40, so a 75, or 7.5 centimeter, as the German had said, on the JU-88. It won't be a surprise to any of you that putting a one ton, 7.5 centimeter gun with a hefty recoil into a gun pod underneath a JU-88 has some drawbacks from the handling of the speed, the center of gravity, and so on. Beyond that, however, when they started trial shooting at tanks on target ranges, they soon discovered that the JU-88 really did not like this. The firing test of the JU-88P1 with PAC-40s is carried out with five aircraft. So far, 216 rounds have been fired at a Russian T-34 tank during 25 takeoffs, with a total flight time of 12 hours and 55 minutes. During the one-week test, only one to two aircraft could be made ready for flight and firing each day due to insufficient technical support, lack of personnel, and the amount of repair work on the aircraft's surface skins. Now at this point I'm in an inconvenient pickle because of copyright laws. I can show you the text of the file, but I can't show you the pictures that come with it. So a 2D representation where I will place all the points of damage has to suffice for now. During the trials it became apparent that the engine counting plates could not withstand the high gas pressure of the gun. After 15 to 20 rounds the plates were deformed and torn, screws are loose or ripped off as are the rivets in the plates. Handhold covers were torn off during firing despite being secured with strapping. After 54 shots, a crack was found on one propeller blade. On one aircraft, the tips of both air screws flew off after the 36th shot. The left propeller was changed after the 31st shot and thus had only five shots. Shooting-wise, the airplane is faultless. From a weapon technical point of view, the loading table and the feed can be criticized. Well, I did tell you there was going to be a lot of damage. The plane was basically starting to disintegrate with every shot, which is such a bad thing to happen. So to get a second opinion on this, I sent the report off to Luke Rickard. He's a Patreon supporter and structural engineer working on aircraft. And I asked him to get his thoughts on this. And he sent me a short summary and here it is. Being this far removed in time and with limited available information, it is possible only to speculate, but the unsuitability of this gun installation is clear. What appears to have happened is an inertial phenomenon, much like which allows you to install an axe head by hitting the end of the handle while holding it in the air. The wing mounted engines would stay more or less in place while the fuselage and the gun mount moved rearward. Even with the hydraulic buffers, this is a dynamic load much different than the forces generated by propeller thrust. Additionally, there may be damage due to the muzzle device, which directs the gases to the sides to reduce recoil, but also could cause damage to the sides of the engine as seen with the louvers. So, at least in the case of the JU-88, mounting a 7.5cm gun seems like a very poor idea.
files I have on planes like the JU-87, the BF-110, the Henshaw 129, well, they were also used in a similar role, but they often talk about the fact that their lack of speed, plus their size, plus the low altitude that they're operating at, made them very vulnerable. And a JU-88 with a Pac-40 strapped to it will not fare much better. Most likely, somewhat worse. These trials, of course, emerged from the German attempt to try out as many different solutions as possible to field aircraft with anti-tank capabilities, at least from the stuff that was available from, to them at the time. They basically tried every combination that they could find, and in the end they used what stuck, and that was not the big guns. Lower caliber, high velocity guns, those yielded somewhat successful results without impairing an aircraft too much. So we're talking about a 3cm MK-101 or an MK-103, as well as the 3.7cm BK-37s. The JU-88P then, with the Pac-40, was not a successful product. Barely usable in combat conditions, and ultimately we can consider it a failure. But I do want to leave you with a positive note and show you a good product, one that won't shake itself apart for use. And that is, of course, oof, 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 the Thrustmaster Pendular Rudder Pedals. You can't see me, can you? Well, what's the link to the video? First of all, they weigh about as much as an anti-tank gun. I am not joking, but they are absolutely fantastic. They are my favorite flight simming tool at the moment. And uh, this has a little bit of history because I used to use rudder pedals from another company, company uh, lots of plastic, and I was basically learning how to, how shall we say, how to salsa on them in order to get the plane lined up properly. However, <clears throat> Thrustmaster pedals have finally given me really silky smooth control of the aircraft. I feel like I'm pretty much floating through the air. There we go. So smooth. Look at that, it's so smooth. You may think that's their talking points and not mine, but no, I actually threw theirs out because I think mine are better. Anyway, these pedals have literally... One second. They have literally changed my cycling experience. It's plug and play, quick adjustment with the rudder pedal to my preference and off I go. Incidentally, they also made my shooting a lot better, especially with the big boy guns. And yeah, Trustmaster of course also makes fantastic Hotas Warthog and many other control peripherals. So snack yourself that discount. And really it's a hefty discount. Use the code MA15 from the 4th of May to the 11th of May and you'll get 15% off a fantastic range of Thrustmaster's flight peripherals. There's the Hotas Warthog, there's the Pendular Rudder Pedals, the FA-18 and the F-16 stick. You also have the T-1600 MFCS Hotas setup and the T-Flight headset. And yes, I did use the product since and I have checked this. This is gonna hold 2014. That's when I got the Thrustmaster 16,000M, and it survived multiple trips via airports, uh, going from multiple countries, and it still works to this present day. So, if you are in the market of getting yourself a quality control peripheral for your flight simming experience, if you want to upgrade to something that is really going to last you for a long time, get something via the link in the description below and uh, you are not going to regret it. It is absolutely fantastic. I'm going to go back to them now and play and fly around a little bit, maybe in DCS or IL2, because I'm really missing it once again. And yeah, I wish all of you guys a fantastic day. Keep staying legends. Big thank you here to Bernard from Military History Visualize for his help with icons, as well as Luke Rickard for his correspondence with me on the JU-88. Structural failings, and all of you have a fantastic day, and see you in the sky. Why does it move so smooth on the table? And then once I pick it up, it becomes... Ugh.